Good morning to those joining from the UK. Uh, good afternoon to those joining from Malaysia. And I suspect we may have some, some colleagues joining us from elsewhere uh, in the world as well. Welcome to this uh, British Council uh, event, looking at uh, um, perspectives on international collaboration and in particular the role of industry engagement in, in the UK, Malaysia, and what prospects that has for um, collaboration uh, between uh, HEIs in those two, two countries. Um, we're going to be, uh, the event will run for a couple of hours this morning. We have an excellent lineup of speakers um, and, and we've had seen huge interest in the event and we have quite a large number of, of participants with us this morning. If I could just start with some housekeeping um, matters just to help the, the the event run as smoothly as possible and um, just to be aware we are recording um the the, the webinar and um, that's already commenced um so um, please be aware of that could i ask all participants in in the event to kindly mute your microphone and, and turn off your your video um during the session um, I would ask that the speakers uh, uh, do likewise, but but obviously for your sessions where you're speaking, please um, have your video on and your your microphone on as well for that. Um, uh, we do have do be aware that we we have had a, 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 a we do have a capacity limit on the event, um, and if you do leave, you may not be able to join back in um, uh, because of that as we as we go forwards. If you do have some questions, either for the speakers or in general, please do submit those through the chat box function, and we will try our best to to respond to those and pick them up as a result of the uh, either at the end of each speaker session or uh, at the end or, or potentially also in our report that we will be doing um, at the end of the uh, event. So we do plan um, uh, to, to include a summary of, of some of the key messages and um, um, comments from from the event today. We'll be sharing that with you on the, the British Council's website after the webinar. Um, that will take a, a, a few days to develop and bring together, but that will be available um, in due course. Um, so thank you for that. I hope that's um, uh, clear. Uh, we will be posting into the chat a link to the um, uh, uh, a link to the uh, resources and, and website for the British Council where the report and, and follow up information will go. So just moving on to the agenda for the morning, we have a fantastic lineup of, of speakers this morning um, who will be discussing a range of, of, of aspects of, of industry, collaboration and international perspectives in this area, bringing with them a, a, an incredible wealth of, of experience and expertise in this area. Uh, in a few minutes, I will hand over to formally um, sort of welcome you and, and, and make some opening remarks to, to Prabha Sundaram from the British Council uh, in, in Malaysia, who's head of the education um, uh, area there. Um, we'll be starting off with a few, an overview of the landscape, um, and then we'll move quickly on to the um, uh, some perspectives from the, the speakers and their um, experience in in these areas. We'll probably end uh, at close um, somewhere around um, um, uh, uh, 17:50 or 9:50 in the UK um, as as we progress. So just to be aware, this is a, an initial event taking a broad look at the, the issues around this, and it is planned as, a, as the first event in a, in a series of conversations and events that will be supported by the British Council um, involving UK and Malaysia uh, stakeholders in an area that will be, al be able to explore some of the um, some of the practices and issues in more detail, perhaps focusing on aspects of this, this area as we move forward. So today, uh, we're going to use today as a way of summarising and, and gathering up some of those those issues and opportunities and the report that comes from the event will help shape um, the nature of the events and focus um, in in the coming uh, weeks and months for this this area activity. So without further ado, let me hand over to Prabha to, to say a few words and welcome you to the event. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And uh, wishing everyone a very warm welcome. Good afternoon to those joining us from Malaysia and a very good morning to our speakers and uh, participants from the UK. Welcome to our British Council webinar, Perspectives on International Collaboration, specifically considering the role of industry engagement in UK and Malaysia higher education partnerships and collaborations. This British Council event, as uh, Dan just explained, considers how the development of industry engagement practices in higher education is reflected in partnership opportunities between the UK and Malaysia. 
and the event is set against a very, very strong and long standing background of UK Malaysia high education collaboration and a focus in both countries on the role of university industry engagement in driving excellence, impact and economic outcomes from research and education activities. We all know that there are many commonalities in the higher education internationalization priorities of both UK and Malaysia. University industry collaboration has been identified as a key strategic item on Malaysia's agenda for transforming itself into a knowledge and innovation based economy. This is stated in our Malaysian higher education blueprint. Whilst in the UK, industry engagement has been a sustained policy focus for universities. The question is, how do we leverage on these commonalities to further our respective agendas of enhancing university industry links? Can international partnerships between the UK and Malaysia enable us to create even greater value and mutual benefit by creating new research opportunities, enhancing graduate employability and skills, which is a huge priority in both our countries at the moment, developing relevant curricula with a focus on digitalization, upskilling faculty, driving societal impact, perhaps in line with the SDGs. Can all of this be achieved and, and what are the uh, what are the, the collaborations or the links that need to be put in place and policies that need to be prioritized for this to happen? So this webinar is designed to provide a broad brush perspective on the current UK and Malaysian landscape for university industry engagement. Uh, Dan King himself has been involved in previous research in this area, which he will share with you a little bit later in his uh, contact setting um, session. But today, through conversations with our panelists, we want to explore challenges and opportunities in fostering greater collaborations, especially in the COVID-19 era, and discuss frameworks and models of best practices that work, that can support further university industry partnerships and collaborative opportunities. There is obviously much interest in this area. We were totally oversubscribed for this webinar, and, um, and we, we were very pleasantly surprised. This is just the start of the conversations, ladies and gentlemen, and we hope that today's discussions will help us to identify key areas of focus that we can then explore in greater depth. And hopefully that can help us to strengthen collaborations for industry engagement within the UK and Malaysian higher education sectors. So looking forward to the discussions today and over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Prabha. So I, I'm going to start this morning with um, a, a little bit of context setting, a few slides just to set the scene and discuss some of the previous work and, and lay out a few uh, of the landscapes, both for the UK and Malaysia that are relevant here. And then we'll we'll move swiftly on to, to looking um, to hearing from our first set of speakers. So uh, my colleague is, is, is pushing on the slides for me, so that we'll, we'll, we'll progress through these. We just wanted to emphasize really the, the existing levels of collaboration between the UK uh, and, and Malaysia um, in terms of the universities. Um, in, in, in the UK, there are something like 14,000 Malaysian students currently studying in the UK, including nearly 500 doctoral research students. Um, there's also staff, academic staff in the UK from Malaysia, and five UK universities have campuses in Malaysia. So there's already a great um, opportunity for engagement and, and development. There's already a range of UK Malaysia university partnerships and collaborations, um, not least through those supported through the Newton uh, Unku Omar Fund. Um, Malaysia itself is one of the, uh, I think, for uh, the second largest host country for UK transnational education, um, delivering a, a high quality learning experience to students in Malaysia. And, and in research, um, the, the numbers of co-authored um, publications are, are quite significant. Nearly 14,000 were published in the, in the 10 years, 2010, 2019. And uh, interestingly, just over a third of these um, have been were published in just the last three years. So there is a, uh, an accelerated in that particular aspect of, um, uh, of research uh, and that involves something like 69 different um, Malaysian institutions and organisations. So there is already a backdrop of, of collaboration and activity um, uh, supporting this area and if we just go on to the next slide please. Um, 
looking more explicitly at, at industry engagement. So some of the, the collaboration is, is in different areas, um, but we're particularly interested in what is the scope um, in terms of work that involves industry. It could be around good practice, shared practice. It could be around specific activities um, that, that are linking um, uh, linking and, and building partnerships. We're going to hear from speakers later in today who are already involved in, in, in uh, UK-Malaysia partnership work and be interesting to hear their perspectives on how uh, they see opportunities for, for industry engagement to become part of that, um, part of that uh, collaborative working. In terms of industry engagement, uh, HE has a huge contribution um, and opportunity in terms of working. Much of this is already happening at scale in both countries, but there are equally in both countries there are there are opportunities to do more and to do better. Here we just lay out some of the areas in which industry engagement is really important for universities, for, for research, for stakeholders, for uh, the, for development of the curriculum, for employer skills, and also for, for students in terms of placements uh, and, and employability. And increasingly, there is also an expectation of universities around how they contribute to their local area and grow the local economy, um, particularly uh, through working with small businesses, creating startups and supporting uh, the innovation ecosystem in their areas. And what we do pull out a little bit here are those um, differences between working with those big corporate large businesses often who have an international footprint and perhaps some of those um, uh, those businesses who are smaller and more local um, and, and where complementary approaches to support their engagement are needed. There has been a sustained policy focus in both countries uh, in terms of university industry engagement, both from a perspective of, of R&D, but also in terms of the way universities work and, and deliver value to their to their key stakeholders. I think what I would emphasize is, is, in, is in both cases, it's been recognized um, and measures have been put in along the way to support demand from industry. Um, as well as um, getting the universities to engage and, and, and outreach, it's equally important that there is a strong demand and engagement from industry. Um, in Malaysia, key uh, problem mentioned the education blueprint 2015-25, uh, in particular, the identification of, of innovation ecosystems as a priority. Some fantastic work by the, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia through their Science Outlook um, uh, flagship um, reviews of science, technology and innovation uh, in Malaysia is really informative in terms of where uh, Malaysia is right now and, and how it is developing in this particular area, a wealth of information in there. And more recently, um, the Ministry of Higher Education identifying priorities for recovery from impact, uh, very much focusing on the network supporting industry collaboration, entrepreneurship, um, graduate uh, employability factors in there. In the UK, uh, there were almost too many reviews to list, but, but over a 15 year period, we had at least 10 independent reviews of, of relating to university and industry engagement. Some over 300 recommendations emerged from those. Some of those um, led to, um, uh, well, one in particular led to the creation of the National Centre for Universities and Business, and we'll he be hearing from them later. Um, the range of interventions and support that has come through, and the, the, the UK has been building on these over time. More recently, We've uh, identified an ambition to raise R&D expenditure to 2.4% of GDP by 2027, and that's been driving a lot of the recent policy work. Um, international collaboration has been strongly recognised in, in recent strategy uh, and, 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 and policy areas and continues to be an area of, of, of some strength in terms of the, the international collaboration and some of the some aspects of working with industry. More recently, for those who are working to support um, uh, business engagement, um, the Knowledge Exchange Framework and the, the, the Knowledge Exchange Concordat have, have brought together a, a focus on, on continuous improvement and, and continuing to build and improve the practices of working with, with industry partners and other external stakeholders. And it's worth having a look at those um, if you're not familiar with those. Universities are currently working on um, parts of the KE Concordat, those who are going to participate in the first year of this um, and it's very much a, a, a self-evaluation of, of how effectively they are working um, uh, all the way through from mission and strategy down to the practices of engaging with external partners. 
So the British Council, if we could go to the next slide, um, has, has previously supported work related to this area. In particular, within um, uh, Malaysia, there's been a focus on, on supporting technology transfer um, through the, the UK-Malaysia Higher Education Partnerships Programme that the British Council was running. That involves scoping report, looking at recommendations for ways in which collaboration and development could be progressed, and culminated in supporting nine relatively small um, UK-Malaysia university-to-university partnerships. Um, and I'll on to that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, also 2018-19 there was a wider Southeast Asia look at industry engagement and a scoping report was produced which brought together some ideas about the ways in which um, collaboration could be supported including through things like doctoral training, um, something that we see particularly in the UK where there's significant industry engagement in those areas now. And I just mentioned those nine projects that were relatively small projects, but actually um, had quite an impact in terms of de delivering some great outcomes that were supporting the development of technology transfer and, and thinking about research commercialization in its wider sense. Those, those nine projects actually had engagement with over 40 companies and other stakeholders, uh, government agencies. They looked at inter there was international partnership development. Quite a few of them were extending from a small seed bit of funding into other other work and and in, in also into other areas and development of those. So that was a, a very successful small program that directly supported the development of some collaboration. And despite the impact of COVID-19, um, these were able to progress um, quite well during that that period. So there are still progress and challenges, and, and to some degree, I was struck that there are there are there are very similar challenges um, in both UK and Malaysia in terms of where where things stand right now. Certainly for Malaysia, there is there is still a challenge about growing the private sector demand for both for research, but also in terms of some of the engagement um, with 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 higher education and and how to lead that through to improve innovation. Um, particularly through, the, through uh, R and D activity that's at the at the sort of higher um, uh, at the experimental development end of things, moving beyond basic and applied research. Um, so developing that private sector demand, but also thinking about industry engagement in the wider areas in the curriculum and model supporting employer skills and student employability. And there's also a, an area around enterprise and entrepreneurial activities um, to support and actually grow and, and hopefully to grow the number of um, uh, innovative companies in the country. In the UK, we've made considerable progress in university industry engagement over the last 20 years. But as I mentioned, around the, Con the KE Concordat, we're still looking to develop and improve that, increasing the impact and exploitation of research developing ways to work in partnership that improve the engagement within, with key industry players in all aspects of the university activity. We still want to continue and grow and incentivize private sector R&D and expand the experience and capability of, of a much wider group of academics and researchers in, in working with industry. There are some excellent experienced people, but also there's a wider group where we'd like to see more engagement and more experience developed. And behind this, of course, there are the changing skill needs of employers themselves and how universities can support that in a very fast changing world with many new challenges emerging for employers and something we've seen really quite acutely in the last um, the last year as a result of the COVID pandemic. So that's a, a quick run through. Um, uh, some of the, the the issues and policy landscapes and collaboration landscapes that exist between the UK and um, and Malaysia. So I'd I'd like to to pause there and and move on to introduce our first um, speaker session. So over the next 20 minutes, we're going to hear from uh, two uh, um, senior and highly experienced academics in in this area. Um, I'm just going to to introduce them now. So our first session is going to look at perspectives on international higher education collaboration and the role of university industry partnerships. So I'd I'd like to welcome Professor uh, Zulkilfi Abdul Razak, who's rector from the International Is Islamic University Malaysia, uh, previously vice chancellor of the University Sans Malaysia uh, from 2000 to 2011. He's also the immediate past president of the International Association of uh, Universities, a UNESCO affiliated organization. Anzul was uh, an honorary professor at the University of Nottingham uh, from 2014 until uh, 2020. So he's huge experience um, of, of university uh, uh, internationally. I'd also like to introduce Professor Simon Guy, who's Provost Chancellor Global at the University of Lancaster 
the university has strong Malaysia connections and strengths uh, in industry engagement notable within the, the UK um, in this area and in, has a strategic partnership with Sunway University in, in Malaysia as well. His own research background is in sustainable urbanism and has secured significant industry funding, um, including a, a major award from industry to establish a, a sustainable consumption institute at the University of Manchester. So perhaps I'll, I'll come to um, uh, Professor Zul first, and perhaps you'd like to uh, speak, and then we, we come to you, Professor Guy. So over to you, uh, Professor Zul. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, Prabha, for uh, inviting me into this uh, very important session. Uh, and I'm indeed uh, very honoured uh, to be here and uh, sharing some of the things that I think is of concern to us uh, in Malaysia, but also I think internationally, particularly from, from the view of the Global South. Uh, it is a difficult topic to deal with because we have not gone into the full scale of COVID-19. We are still now uh, guessing what's going to happen uh, uh, after that. But we can already see a number of trends, which I will kind of uh, try to summarize. It may, it may not be accurate, but I think there is something that we'll probably need to keep in mind. Yeah? Uh, I uh, acknowledge what was said. Uh, I think the uh, relationship between Malaysia and uh, UK uh, in terms of education in general, and, and of course, uh, training, postgraduate training in particular, I think has gone uh, way beyond what we expect. And I hope this is something that will continue. But nevertheless, I think the, the, the issue that we need to talk about is what will happen uh, beyond this COVID-19, right? So when we talk about uh, the university uh, industrial engagement, uh, one of the challenges that, uh, that we see, you know, from our point of view, from the university point of view, there are a number of things that we are now going to be uh, very uh, aware of. Uh, particularly in what we say the, the five the five A's that I would summarize as uh, the first A is a question of availability and the second A is a question of access. Now these are the two issues uh, that used to be uh, quite good but now under the COVID environment uh, these are the two issues that actually is a hampering uh, kind of a relationship between university and industry locally uh, what else between university and industry uh, abroad? Yeah? Uh, we talk about the lockdown uh, uh, that is, you know, everybody knows about this. But more importantly, I think that you often miss is the university uh, are definitely disappointed when the industry itself choose to close down. Uh, when the relationship between industry bar and large is about a kind of a partnership that we provide things for the industry and the industry will provide employment uh, to the university to the extent that Malaysian University are all gauged by how much uh, how many employed uh, graduates can we provide and it is one of the KPIs that it were and suddenly when COVID comes down uh, these numbers do not mean anything anymore uh, when the industry closed down and industry literally tell us we will not be able to accept your students you need to fend for yourself because we have uh, you know, some problems with economics and so on and so forth. And in a way, an university is left is left in the lurch. Yeah? University certainly cannot close down. Uh, in fact, the number of uh, students that we have to entertain in the context of uh, COVID-19 becomes even more pressing uh, because we need to provide for them uh, as they move along. So as, as far as availability and accessibility in that sense, I think is really a big challenge as, as far as university is concerned. How do you now guarantee students who have gone to the course uh, and now are about to graduate and where are they going to get employment and how do they get uh, you know, jobs uh, when everything else has changed uh, almost overnight and we are now just pushed aside uh, as far as that's concerned. The third, the, third A, the third A I think is affordability. And it is another, another issue that particularly relates to, to finance. Um, the money has, is there, but the money now has been channeled into various things in trying to cope uh, with what the pandemic uh, is, is giving us. Uh, question of you know uh, giving uh, extra uh, food, uh, uh, accommodation, and all the things that I think we know that this money now has gone into into a different section where I think life comes first uh, rather than rather than livelihood per se. 
and therefore the the issue of also grants and 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 fundings that used to be available now becomes a little bit more scarce uh, to move forward so again uh, the the other uh, the, uh, call, uh, the the future uh, doesn't look uh, as bright uh, as as that is concerned a question uh, the next a what i would talk about is appropriateness uh, when once we look at the covid 19 uh, the kind of priority somehow or rather will change now uh, because we are talking about very fundamental things that has been left out. Uh, in the question of technology, for example, uh, there are many things that we have been talking about that has not taken place, now suddenly needs to come uh, forward because of the uh, situation that I've described. Uh, people need to go log on, uh, online learning and so on and so forth and so on and so forth, whether this is appropriate is another issue that we are still debating. For example, in Malaysia, when there are still a huge number of students who are in, in, the, in the rural area where connectivity is not good, uh, when uh, facilities as far as uh, technology is not ready, ready for, for the uh, virtual sort of use, uh, these are issues of appropriateness that we need to think about and then reprioritize what is uh, appropriate uh, moving forward. And last but not least, I think is a question of agility. Uh, how fast can we move? Uh, how much change can we do? Uh, what sort of pol policy change that needs to be uh, in place uh, to make sure that the partnership between the university and the industry goes on? And more, more importantly, the survival of the university itself. I think these are, these are issues that I uh, that we are confronted uh, with from the last one year, and it looks as though for the next year uh, coming on, as long as uh, COVID-19 is still there, I think we will need to be very much aware of this kind, this kind of issue. But what sort of uh, opportunity do we have? I think the opportunity basically is uh, what I would summarize in the, in, in the acronym COVID itself. I think we need to move very quickly to the to the idea of collaborative. I think uh, Dan has shown this is something that has worked before, uh, rather than competition per se. Where we need to do more collaboration, more uh, partnership on equal terms, and meeting the context of different countries. Uh, UK and and you and Malaysia may have a different context, and how do you collaborate to make sure that this context remain in, intact as it were, right? The O, I would say, is a kind of openness, uh, how we can uh, work together in, in a very open and, and, and transparent sort of way. And I would quote uh, later on, uh, the, the, the vaccine experience uh, will tell us how open we are uh, when it comes to collaboration that would benefit uh, both countries, or in fact, the world and the world as it were. Uh, we talk about V as a kind of values. Uh, the new values that needs to be defined. And this is where I will talk a little bit more when you talk about what are the models that we need to look at. I think some of the values that is now very important as far as uh, COVID is concerned, it needs to be put back. A question of, for example, uh, uh, empathy, yeah? uh, which has not been factored at all in our education system, needs to come on board if the question of collaboration and openness operate at, at an optimal level. And I is, of course, inclusiveness. Uh, inclusiveness, again, in our context, would be uh, people from the rural sector, uh, people who are marginalized, uh, the indigenous population that has been there for a long time but has not been given enough emphasis. I think these are the opportunities that COVID tells us until and, until, until and unless you deal with this group of vulnerable people, you will not be able to move on as far as as, as far as education is concerned. And last but not least is appreciating, appreciating diversity, uh, where diversity ought to be uh, one of the major factors in trying to look for new solutions and therefore going out from just the dominant what we see into something which is uh, locally, uh, what you call a recognized uh, in, in terms of its wisdom and also uh, indigenous indigenous, indigenous knowledge as such. So those are those are the variants that I see uh, in terms of challenges and 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 and, uh, and opportunities. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, what what models do do we accept? And we have been experimenting on this uh, when we look at what 
the system used to be uh, in, in trying to work with the, with the industry. The industry has been focused so much on what I would call the four M's, that is training for manpower, all right, the question of employment, employability, uh, working on the human minds in terms of innovation, creativity, producing new products that will be then marketable, and uh, including the, the graduates itself, and then moving on to high tech, uh, where the machines. Is. These, are, these are the three M's when we talk about uh, industry that we need to be uh, what we call well-versed in, uh, so that we can get acceptance uh, in, in the industry itself. But uh, the COVID tells us this model may not sustain. Uh, as I've mentioned, I think uh, a question of employment and employability has changed drastically uh, over a period of time. People are now talking about permanent unemployment uh, because the industry will not be able to cope uh, with the kind of uh, uh, people who are laid off or people who are, you know, uh, losing uh, livelihoods and so on and so forth. We need to look at a different sort of model, uh, as it were. And the new model that we have been, been toying uh, uh, with is uh, to extend this uh, whole idea of just training human beings uh, as an individual uh, for markets and for jobs. Uh, we want to look at a larger spectrum of where, where do you situate humanity in this particular context. In other words, the kind of value that we want to bring in is just beyond livelihood, but talking about how do we save life and how do we make life meaningful, not only to a, sec a sector of people, but generally the, the, world, uh, the world over. Uh, is, is so a, a new dimension that comes in where we say there must be an element of sympathy as a kind of value. How do you sympathize with other people uh, in trying to make uh, life more uh, tenable and also to make the industry more responsible uh, in, in developing communities rather than just industry per se? Uh, we work together with, with a lot of communities now uh, because they are really in, in, in a dire need. Uh, without, with or without the industry. And the university in that particular sense are using whatever they have to support the community around us. Suddenly, I think the university uh, are, are aware of the kind of responsibility that they have neglected so far in trying to support the community and the community around them with or without industry as such. Yeah? Uh, we are also beginning to talk about not just training the mind, but also training the heart. In other words, how do we get our student to be empathy, uh, to learn to be empathy? In other words, the student now needs to move out of the classroom needs to move out of the you know um, the the manufactured quote unquote environment to the natural environment of why where life actually uh, is important, and this is where we now talk about uh, community engagement uh, beside just industry and how do we bring industry when we talk about community engagement at the same time so that when we talk about poverty we do understand what poverty is all about rather than just from the textbook uh, sort of uh, idea or more importantly only from the industry point of view of what poverty is all about i mean it is it is in malaysia uh, kind of appalling to me when we find that some of the industry that produce uh, rubber gloves uh, for the world i think they are making tons of money but yet we find two to three thousand of their workers are covid positive it's another this value that you talk about uh, do not even exist in industry, and many industries are like that. In fact, now uh, the issues of COVID uh, uh, infection are basically uh, being assigned to many of the manufacturing sectors. You know, so these are these are things which I think it is important, and and therefore we talk about uh, we talk about values. What do values? Uh, what are the values that we need to put in as we build? this partnership between university and industry so that we can ensure not only the survival of industry, but the survival of the community and the nation as such, given the, 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 the environment that we are in today. And last but not least, I, I, I want to also, as we look at how vaccines being developed all over the world, as a kind of a learning uh, sort of uh, a lesson that we need to learn as much as we talk about working together and so on and so forth. I think this issue of what they call vaccine nationalism, and now the new words have been coined like vaccine apathy. 
uh, only certain parts of the world uh, are, are privileged to this. Larger part of the world is not. The United Nations Secretary General at one point talked about 10 countries has used 75% of their vaccines when 130 countries have not even get a shot. I mean, it is almost like a hypocrisy uh, when we talk about all these good things, but on the ground when it comes to the crunch, when life is actually threatened, we do not see this being uh, handled or we don't see you do walk the talk, you know. So these are issues that I think we need to uh, grapple with. It sounds very brutal, but at the end of the day, this is what I want to, to bring on record. Thank you very much. Thank, th thank you, Professor Zhu. Um, very useful overview of, of, of some of the issues there and the big the big picture. And of course, COVID is going to be such a dominating issue, the recovery and, and how that is dealt with, which has affected so many parts of of, of every economy um, globally. Can I just check? I, I, I'm not sure if we have Professor Guy with us at the moment. Um, so if not, yeah, propose that we move on. Oh, you're, you're there. Excellent. Right. So we couldn't see you in the... Um, yes, so perhaps um, could, could perhaps you could you could follow through with uh, some of the observations and, and follow ups on 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 this issue and how you see it from your perspective at Lancaster. OK, well, what I thought well, I would do, Dan, and, and thank you for the invitation and, and good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Um, I work at Lancaster University. Um, for those that don't know Lancaster, we're about an hour, an hour north of, of Manchester in the UK, uh, founded in, in the early 1960s. Uh, and have grown over the last 50 years to be a top 10 ranked uh, UK university. Uh, and an important part of our, of our strategy has been internationalization. So I wanted to give that little bit of kind of context about why, why we are operating in Malaysia and in fact been operating uh, for the past 15 years. We also have campuses out uh, in Ghana in China and have recently opened a campus in Leipzig. Um, so I think an important component, first component of any conversation about partnership really is your strategic rationale and why it makes sense. And probably the worst possible reason you can use is just just be opportunistic uh, and, and grab with that without having a real strategic intent about what you're trying to achieve. Because I think longer term commitment and building mature partnerships is probably absolutely key to success. And uh, <clears throat> that's the kind of background, because I think that's something that we've achieved in Malaysia in our long term partnership, now celebrating our 15 years with Sunway University. Um, we established our partnership way back in 2005 with only eight students. Uh, we now have currently over 5000 students. Um, I think it makes us about the fourth largest provider of TNA in, in Malaysia, according to the HESA data. And we work across providing degree programs, staff and student mobility, and increasingly now research cooperation, which is what I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit more. Um, so students only take one program of study. Um, we currently have 23 programs and four master's degrees, but you get awards from both Sunway University and Lancaster University. And uh, since we came together in our partnership, We've had over 6,300 students graduated from the from the from the programs. So this is something that's now matured over time and is now, I think, at scale. And it's something that we're keen to develop further. And we have new programs in development. In terms of the the issue at hand this morning around research and industry engage, engagement, that's something we've come to in the in the more recent years of our of our partnership building on the maturity of the platform of our, of our edu education collaboration. And we've been working together, exploring research collaborations over a number of years ago. And about 18 months ago, this consolidated into the joint funding and launch of a Future Cities Research Institute. So here we're very keen to come together uh, in total partnership, which is another word I think we've already heard this morning and is absolutely key, to co-design and co-develop and co-own uh, a research institute which is truly global uh, in intent and ambition. So rooted in, in Malaysia, but also looking outward to the world and building on that collaboration of the research strengths in the UK with a model of real co-learning fr from each other. Uh, and in terms of our agenda, we're very interested here in the whole area of sustainability, which has obviously been growing in importance. Lancaster recently declared the climate emergency um, and Sunway has been committed from, from its uh, founding in the, into the SDGs. In the role of digital cities as well, which of course with the, our experience of the pandemic that we've already heard uh, a little bit about, 
has been absolutely key uh, in kind of meeting the challenges. And another key word that we've heard this morning already, agility. It is our kind of digital capabilities and learning that has given us that agility to respond as we have done to the pandemic to date. And in terms of livable cities as well. And again, the pandemic has, has, has um, brought to a clear attention some of the challenges of the uh, kind of intensity of living in urban environments uh, and some of the health challenges of that and some of the questions of the future about how we redesign and replan cities to be safer uh, in health terms as well from, from any future kind of pandemics as well. So we think a, a very much an agenda of its time uh, and very much rooted in the kind of priorities that we're seeing in the UK, in Malaysia, in terms of the new 1010 research program, and of course, indeed, globally. These are global challenges. Um, so we see research and industry collaboration is actually key now to the next phase of growth of our partnership with Sunway, uh, both in developing postgraduate degrees, but importantly, research, as, a, as I've said. And I think key, I would say, I recognize all the challenges that we've heard about this morning, um, but perhaps to provide a complement to that, um, I think we have seen through the pandemic the development of agility, uh, notwithstanding the, the very real issues of kind of equity that we've also heard about this morning. Um, I think the digital has, has shown the power we have to continue collaborating and our partnership has, has very much survived and even thrived, I would say. We've come, almost grown closer through our experience with some way of of dealing and meeting the challenges of the pandemic. And that's proud of the, the foundations, I think, um, for renewed partnership in the face of those future research challenges and, of course, the opportunities that will come. Of course, there are real funding challenges facing, facing us around research now. And, of course, for our, for our industry partners, uh, we're still dealing with the fact in the UK that the GCRF funding uh, has now been sliced in half. Uh, and that's a real challenge in the uh, in the short and medium term. But we're very confident with the establishment of the Future Search Cities Research Institute that the scale of the of the new global challenges f facing us will have to be responded to in terms of new flows of research funding and new industries will respond to these uh, to these kinds of global challenges. And universities and university partners like ours with Sunway are well positioned to respond. Uh, and take those new opportunities for collaboration going forward. So I'm aware that we're short of time this morning, so I could say so much more, but I, perhaps I can pause there and uh, we can we can uh, see if there's any time for questions. If not, I hope that's a useful contribution. Excellent. That, thank you. That was so helpful. And, and I think really excellent to see how our sort of conversations around the bigger strategic pictures around collaboration manifest in a specific opportunity which has been developing and sustained. And I think that your, your comments around the strategic intent for some of these partnerships are really, uh, really important to uh, to ensure their success and move forwards. Um, I think I'm going to move on to our to our next set of speakers, but thank you for that. The, those two contributions there. Um, uh, it's clear just how much COVID is is dominating some of these things, and and will will for the near future be a major factor in how these things get um, taken forward. But I'm I'm going to move on and come on to our next two speakers. Thank you very much, Professor Zul and Professor Guy. Some excellent starting contributions for us there. Um, our next session is going to focus a little bit more on research and potentially move into doctoral training. We have two hugely experienced speakers um, that will be we talking um, uh, on this. I'm going to come to Professor Chris Garada first, um, but I'll just introduce our two um, two speakers for this session. We have Professor Shahir from uh, UTP in Malaysia and Professor Chris Garada from the University of Nottingham in the UK. Professor Shahir spent 23 years in industry and joined University Technology Patronus 11 years ago. He's currently Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, Innovation and Commercialization, and is active engaging in engaging industry leaders from the region uh, to, to develop and further industry academic collaboration. Professor Chris, Chris Garada is Associate Provost Chancellor for Industrial Strategy, Business Engagement and Impact at the University of Nottingham. And between 2016 and 2018, he was Vice Provost for Research and Knowledge Exchange at the University of Nottingham's Ningbo China um, uh, campus. And as a professor of electrical machines, he has huge experience of working with industry in international contexts and collaborations and is also director of the Cummins Innovation Centre. So, Chris, um, over to you for your, your observations. Thank you. 
Hey, uh, thanks, Dan, for the uh, invite, and I'm very happy to see the attendance in the seminar. Um, uh, it's very heartening, and I very much subscribe to uh, to the uh, to the you know to the comments and discussions which have happened in the, the previous uh, sessions. Um, I think we are all, um, uh, as a global community university, are going through a number of uh, similar uh, problems. Um, which was partly a result of what this uh, COVID situation brought along. And it's very interesting to see how um, us as universities, many times working with industry, I will mention, have been um, strategically looking at ways of working together, both for specifically for uh, within the COVID scenario, but as well um, looking ahead. So as um, Dan mentioned, I'm Chris Gerard, so I've, I've been in the University of Nottingham for now around 20 years. My research has uh, is mostly focused on electrification, and by nature, I've been working very closely with industry partners, mainly in the UK or starting in the UK um, uh, um, um, across the different sectors, industrial sectors. But then, um, in the last years, both as being having a role in uh, Ningbo, in Nottingham Ningbo, and as well in UK, I've been looking at developing the strategy for the University of Nottingham to work closer with our industrial partners. And I'll come um, around a bit around the strategy for, for, um, for doing that. Um, as uh, some many of you will know, you know, uh, Nottingham, again, is quite a, a global in its way it approaches things, not just uh, education, but as well industrial collaboration. We have, of course, many times we, we, we pride ourselves in terms of the campus we have in Malaysia and the other one we have in, uh, in Ningbo. And many of times, and, and, and rightly so, we put those on the pictures because those are two comprehensive campuses where the campus were doing teaching, research, and as well knowledge exchange. In addition to that, perhaps I would like to highlight as well that in addition to those, we have a number of international platforms. Um, uh, Nottingham, we have one in Chile, in fact. Um, we have in China, we have a couple of other industrialization platforms. And as well, recently, a few uh, months ago, we've established a new um, uh, industrialization platform in, the, uh, in Italy. Um, and those are focused, actually, in most cases, those platforms are actually focused on uh, working on research and knowledge exchange, and in all those cases, very closely with um, industrial partners. Uh, why working with industry as a university? There are the obvious things, right, in terms of exploitation of our IP. There is the obvious case of uh, developing win-win partnerships, as again, in Nottingham, we have a number of successful long-term partnerships with industry. Um, given where we are, we have, for example, strong partnerships we have developed with, uh, as an example, a close neighbor to us, Nottingham's Rolls-Royce in Derby, where we currently run for many and many years to technology centers with them. And these this technology centers, we've developed long-term partnerships which covers anything from access to facilities. Again, a lot of time university can um, maintain facilities, which typically would be very difficult for anyone industrial partners to access. We provide training, strategic research, and develop future leaders. So, and these all tend to be all win-win collaboration. And partly because as well, perhaps in the UK, a lot of the funding mechanisms we have today, funding uh, mechanisms like, like through um, Innovate UK or, you know, um, BASE or through the industrial strategy, a lot of times do require, do require um, uh, a significant involvement or cooperation with, between the university and the industry. And that's been all successful. And there's many examples of that. However, having said that, Looking into the future for many reasons, I think there is scope to do much more, both with industrial partnerships in the UK, but as well uh, globally. It's right to highlight as well, looking from the industry, um, um, industry side, that industry are facing a lot of challenges today. Many have already been mentioned by uh, previous speakers. The disruption brought by COVID, it's, it's a big one, um, adapting to digitalization, right? That's another big challenge for many industries. But a lot of other industries, um, especially industries I work closely with, are almost having existential problems. If you look at the aerospace, the automotive, 
transport industry, where these typically are very high value industry, providing a lot of high value jobs, with the move or, or, or towards zero carbon, some of these are having to radically change the way they develop technology, operate, deploy. And of course, the market is moving along with those. And those type of companies, I think the university has a very important role to support them in terms of this rapid transition. How do we do that um, or how do I see it? I think I see engagement with industry have to happen at both the, what I call the low TRL end, low TRL end. That means how can we with industry, not just the traditional model where perhaps we create research at university and then at some point we try to translate it into industry, but there needs to be more co-creation of research at the low TRL end. Um, in, uh, in, in Nottingham, we've been, uh, we've, gained, we've, been, we've been recently quite active in that space, partly because, of course, with the EPSSC support of um, what we call prosperity partnerships, that's a particular funding mechanism uh, by research councils where they can co-invest with industry in that low TRL research by co-creating ideas with industry. We find that that can be very, very useful in terms of many reasons, but one of them is you have already a strategic direction of where you direct your research from earlier on in the, in the research process, and that gives you a much better success in terms of um, um, industrialization or in terms of um, uh, uptake of that research into a, uh, into a solution, so that sort of challenge-led type of programs. Secondly, is access to some superb talent which companies have. The research power is not in universities. There's a lot of great talent in industry and facilities, which today are untapped when it comes to that low TRL research. So forging that partnership with them from earlier on and exploiting some of that talent which is there, both locally, locally being UK and globally, is extremely important. The other end, I call it the higher TRL end, and the process of universities working with industry in the short to medium term in terms of support product development and as well the um, um, uh, commercialization of, of IP or, or, or developed research into industry. Again, in that space, um, there are a lot of mechanisms. However, what the University of Nottingham has seen, and this is particularly not just uh, within UK as well, but as well globally, is this idea of identifying clusters of areas working closely with industry and finding new ways where um, with support from government, we could create translation centers where those translation centers typically being focused in a particular sector. So we really respond to the ways of working of particular sectors. Again, one thing which I've seen, the way you do this work within the food industry or within the electrification industry, or whether you do it in the other industry, the, the finance sectors, the way of uh, the way of, of of translating research or knowledge exchange has to be quite bespoke, and it has to work. It has to work for universities, has to work for industries, and has to work or pin the button for the government, which typically will support the type of activities. Give one quick example, a personal example we had in in Bo, for example, in China. Um, we had some great relationships with a number of corporates in the UK where they had uh, as well bases in China. Um, they, uh, um, we worked with them to develop a plan of where we could work with, our, um, with a particular region in China, and that was uh, close to Ningbo, where they looked at an opportunity. And in this opportunity was uh, many times was close to this electrification, zero carbon activities. And one thing we've done is that we've looked with these car corporates to bring a cluster of companies um, in and universities locally in Ningbo, where we've developed a plan um, of how we could work together and the pin present research, but as well to have a, a good plan for translating that into uh, um, um, an effective market within that local economy. Going to government, we've presented that plan, um, which when we've got funding, very good funding over the next four or five years to do some of that translation work. And, you know, that's as one as example. I'll, I'll stop here with that. I, I appreciate we're uh, working tight on time here. 
um, of how universities can strategically work with industry to make impact in uh, both, you know, both regional where we are based, but as well globally. Then, thank, thanks, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Really important um, messages in there, I think, particularly that those references to co-creation and working with clusters of of businesses, not just you know one to one working, but creating an environment where there's a real. Um, cluster of, of opportunity. Um, I'd be interested to hear uh, Professor Shahir's views on this. So we'll, we'll come to you next, Professor Shahir, and, and see what, what your perspective is from a, a Malaysia uh, landscape on this. Some some interesting observations there from from Chris. And and let's let's go to you now, Professor Shahir. Thank you, Chris, for your comments there. All right. Uh, good morning, Dan. Good morning to all my UK counterparts, uh, and very good evening to all my Malaysian uh, partners over here. First of all, uh, I would like to share with you uh, that uh, in terms of our university, we do not claim to be a big university, but we stay very focused in the area of technology and engineering. Uh, we are looking at uh, those particular aspects of our education as well as our research. And in that context, uh, we are also very pragmatic because we come from uh, conglomerates of oil and gas uh, producers and production people, that is Petronas. But saying all of that, uh, I need to let you know that uh, in terms of our portfolio, we are looking at only about 30% in the, uh, in the uh, hydrocarbon research, another 20% in energy research, and the balance of it would address uh, other part of research. We have consistently uh, shifted our target in terms of addressing SDG 17, and we have, since the last five years, we look at consolidating our research into a, a, a more niche areas, which address only two particular parts. That is the energy sustainability, and the other one is about smart living. So these are the only two teams that we have. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, as a university, and given the opportunity for the last four years to be the Deputy Vice Chancellor, I took a pragmatic view in looking at various aspects First one is I have uh, crafted uh, in looking at the business aspect that is beyond BRICS. Uh, you know, we are looking at countries that are actually having the, uh, the economic power powerhouse that is going to be coming in the next five to 10 years. These are people like Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, you know, the Vietnam and so on. And at the same time, we are also looking at the advanced country, people like United Kingdom, we have at least eight collaborators from various universities in the UK. And uh, we have also been collaborating in the region in a very big way in the Middle East as well as in the United States. Uh, at the same time, uh, what we have done uh, in terms of the uh, industry support, we know that we are quite strong in terms of our fundamental research that is from TRL uh, 1, 2 and 3. And then 4, eventually we engage the industry captains. Uh, what we have done is actually uh, setting up of our technology transfer office in which uh, we look at the various aspects of technology. First of all, we engage uh, a nexus of industry. A nexus of industry, people who are typically, who can pay the bills, right? We are very selective in that. We don't go to everybody. At the same time, we do not forget the SME because some of the SME needs the support that they, that they, that they do in order for them to incentivize uh, their research program. They are small, but they are more agile in a sense. So we cover these two spectrum in terms of the industry. And I think we are very fortunate because we have some very live examples, case studies from Petronas sending their staff to do a doctoral research at UTP, uh, getting relevant degree, uh, working on a set of data that is confidential that belongs to the oil and gas company Petronas and ourselves. And at the same time, we have expanded this opportunity to the Philippines, for example. We have worked very closely with our, our most ardent supporter, uh, that is uh, De La Peña. De La Peña is the Secretary of the uh, Science and Technology in the Philippines, serving the last four presidents of the Philippines. So he must be good. And he has sent his scholars and sent his industry people to study at our university to get their postgraduate degree. Uh, in relevant area using data sets from the Philippines. So these are another examples that we look at. At the same time, uh, if you look at the Middle East front, um, 
Agnog, for example, we have uh, we have trained their people uh, in relevant area in terms of geoscience. Uh, I think you would expect that anyway. And also we have uh, we are also looking at ways how we can we can we can support them more. And we are cons consistently prior to the pandemic uh, promoting the the need to further educate the people in terms of their knowledge and their skill sets so that they will be more advanced in terms of their approaches and in terms of their daily work uh, culture uh, in having that scientific mindset as well. So with that, uh, we have also migrated uh, in some ways to the to the, uh, the Vietnamese side. The Vietnamese front are also sending their, uh, the industry is sending their scholars to our universities to do relevant research. So we have always advocate the fact that we will work with you we work on your data. We work, uh, you know, data is always a king, the power, big data, analytics, and so on. Uh, with that, we can do fundamental research with them. Uh, we, are, we are happy to support them. And uh, we are looking at what sort of formula we do. So in order to develop that, we have, we have came up with the next thing that we try to incentivize. Um, by the way, I mean, our university are looking into towards global prominence in terms of academics and in terms of research. By the same time, we have been told by our mother company, guys, you need to be sustainable as well. So this is another thing that we are developing and we are moving towards creating a nexus of various areas of interest to us by bringing in the universities, group of university, cluster of universities, and also group and cluster of industry together in developing uh, certain interest area and how we obtain the funding. Um, I'm very happy to say uh, that Malaysian government are quite generous in, in terms of funding uh, all the uh, proof of concept, pre-commercialization scheme and so on. Um, it's up to the universities and the industry to actually prove to the government that this is something that is wanted in the future. This is what is going to address the mega trend of the world. The mega trend has shifted significantly. For example, uh, last one, two years, we have been making quite a substantial uh, value of of our university research and consultancy in the area of digitalization yeah but at the same time we are also very pragmatic in the sense that we created the nexus to support other area that's coming up next what is next what is next what is next it has always been the biggest challenge i think to a university environment we don't we don't pretend to know everything we don't pretend to research in everything but we want to remain niche in our areas and we wanted to collaborate with people we do not believe in creating areas you know, uh, that we do not have the expertise to bring in people. That's not the way of the future anymore, and it will not be. And we are operating in a very lean manner from that standpoint. So industry support has always been great. Uh, one of the things that I have discovered for the last two years is that you need to create your own business with the industry. You cannot wait for the industry to come to you. You have to go and see them and share with them what sort of technology you are carrying. When we have a, a nexus of technology transfer office uh, from the from the Philippines all the way to the Middle East. We are actually working in tandem with each other. There are products that cannot be driven in this country. It can be driven in the Philippines. For example, desalination plant. In Malaysia, we have plenty of water. I must be kidding trying to sell a desalination plant in Malaysia. Although it was discovered by, done by our university, we, we actually pilot and actually start up in the Philippines, for example. right? They have 7,000 islands. They need water more than us because of the uh, the purity of the water, the contamination of the water, and so on. So these are some of the examples, and we have also uh, invited a lot of the industry captains to join us. You know, um, they also address, to address their pain points. So we sit down together, and uh, we work in a very smart manner, because, you know, if you talk about energy or the fossil uh, hydrocarbon, I call it, uh, Pertamina has their own university, University of Pertamina. Uh, Petronas has their own university, University of Technology, Petronas, for example, you know, Petrobras, Brazil, for example. So uh, we, we, would, we would tend not to compete with each other. We try to do best practices and we have COP, Community of Practices. And this is something that we have done and encourage the industry to support the, the program and also the industry who are keen to do research. We, we know who they are. We've been researching in those areas. You know, we work, uh, we created our business development unit in searching for those areas and we have uh, developed that formula and the industry would actually send their people to do their doctoral at our university and at our 
our collaborators our, uh, from the region. You know, it can be the Philippines, it can be the Indonesia, the Thailand, and the Vietnam. And also, we are starting to look at the, uh, the European front in terms of United Kingdom as our strong supporter to date. And this is uh, something that we are actually uh, trying to deliver now and creating the nexus. So that, that is in our blueprint for 2021. And I hope this is something that would bring a value to everybody that is involved in the ecosystem. Thank you very much, Dan. That's all that I have. Professor Shere, thank you very much for that uh, input. Again, I think you you emphasised some of the same things Professor Gerardo was talking around there, and that bringing people together, you know, collaborations and clustering of expertise and um, and activity. And I can see in the in the chat there's been a, a series of um, uh, comments and thoughts, particularly I think around how one works with smaller companies. Um, and I know that perhaps that is something that we should um, we should consider as something to focus on in in future events because the um, uh, the, the 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 challenges of working with smaller companies are quite different, but it also sometimes the ways to engage them need to draw on other types of support the university can bring. Just just while we have a moment, Professor Chair, do you have a view on on engaging smaller companies in in research? You asking me, then? Yeah, if you if you have a, a view on on yeah. particularly that, that yeah, how yes. to to better engage small companies in research. Right. right. Okay. Uh, SME in Malaysia, I call it, we call it SME, small, medium enterprise. And uh, these companies are small. Uh, they have small paid up. They, they do not have the kind of funding that they do, but they have a lot of support from the government, right? Government has, is supporting them in a very big ways. So they are addressing their pain points. The, the niche area that they are following up, we, yes, we have been working with a few SMEs in the, in the country today, and we are very uh, closely uh, targeting the areas that they are looking at by addressing what they want to do together jointly. And then at the end of the day, they would agree to pilot that uh, via various grants and schemes from the government. And then we would join force and develop that together. So that's what we have been doing. Uh, we have been doing successfully. I think we are going to have a couple of startups uh, this year, right? So we're keeping our finger crossed. And this is something that we have been doing because uh, uh, we, we strongly believe the SME, uh, Malaysian SME contributed to 37, 37% of our GDP. That's huge, right? So we need to be doing something on that. That's all that have then. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. I think I, I, certainly there's some interesting comments in the chat and I think I'll take this away uh, for the report and we'll think about this in more detail. It may be one aspect of industry engagement that we, 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 we should rightly focus on in the future. There's a huge wealth of opportunity uh, and experience and challenge in this, this particular area. I'm going to move on. Thank you very much to Professor Shahir and Professor Gerada for those really useful comments, some really some common points there around, you know, long term partnerships and um, the clustering and, and collaboration um, at scale and, and the co-creation, working with external partners to, to come up with the right shape uh, of research and ideas there. We're going to move on a little bit in, in this next session and focus a little bit around graduate employability, thinking a little bit about engagement in the in the curriculum and things like placements. We have um, uh, two speakers in, in this session, Professor uh, Camilla Ghazali from the University of Malaya and Dr. Francesca Walter, Walker Martin, who's chair of the work based learning organization ASET and also an academic from the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, Professor Ghazali is Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Malaya, uh, has 20 years of experience in, in various um, uh, leadership roles at the university at national, international levels, and is involved in various editorial. Uh, boards of journals and international advisory committees. Um, previously, she was a Associate Vice Chancellor for International at the University and Director of the International and Corporate Relations um, function. Dr. Francesca Walker Martin is Chair of ASET, which is a work based learning and placement organisation uh, and an academic in the School of Business at the University of Central Lancashire. So ASET as a membership organisation is run by practitioners for the benefit of all placement employability professionals. It's been operating for over 30 years, um, looking at work based learning practices around and, and placements and particularly sharing good practice. So I'm going to come to you first, Professor uh, Ghazili. Thank you. Um, uh, please um, follow on and, and uh, start your camera. All right. Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's, uh, it's really an honor and 
you know, to be to be among um, you know such distinguished uh, speakers in the panel. Um, so I'm I've been following uh, the conversations and the and the presentations, and uh, uh, I'm what I'm going to talk about is um, more classroom level. I'm going to be uh, bringing everyone back into the classroom. Um, just to talk about a new initiative that we have at the University of Malaya that will involve the industry and hopefully what we've, whatever we start locally will be able to also implement at the international level. So um, we have been, University of Malaya has been working with the industry in various different areas that had already been mentioned earlier. Uh, of course, the industry had been together with us in terms of the curriculum review. They have been very instrumental in receiving our students for internship and placements. And uh, we've also had some level of postgraduate uh, co-supervision. Uh, this new in initiative that we are embarking on this coming academic session um, is to bring um, the practitioners into the classroom, from the field into the classroom. So this initiative we have um, uh, that we are about to begin with, we, ha we are calling it Elite at UM program. And Elite actually stands for Experiential Learning with Industry and Technocrats at University of Malaya. So basically what we intend to do is to have our uh, colleagues from the industry come into the classroom to actually give lectures you know, in a structured way, um, not just uh, coming into campus to give talks, uh, like how we have been doing uh, before this. Uh, we have invited, uh, you know, speakers from the industry to come and uh, give guest lectures to postgraduate students, to students, to lecturers, all at once with a particular theme. What we are doing this time is to engage with the industry to actually come into the classroom um, according to the, to the schedule of classes that we have already in place. For example, we will um, you know, show them, say these people who are experts in the field, uh, we will show them the list of topics that we have in a particular course and uh, show them the, the schedule and they will choose um, you know, which lectures uh, they would like to come in for. You know, so we are, we are targeting for them to come at least three times during the course of the semester, uh, which will probably amount to about four hours or six hours, depending on the, uh, on the course. Um, basically, uh, the intention is for the students to be exposed to what they would be able to, well, basically it is to give the students an idea of how they might be able to apply whatever they're learning out there, you know, once they graduate. Because as you know, in public universities in Malaysia, uh, students may not actually get a course or a program that they would like uh, to, uh, you know, it, it may not be their first choice because the students actually apply through a central uh, ministry system, the Ministry of Higher Education system, and they have several choices and uh, several means like up to 12 choices and they may actually get choice number six or number eight or even number 10. And they may not necessarily know everything that they need to know about that particular program. So by having the industry come in, apart from listening to their own uh, lecturers talk about um, the, the course or the program that they are in, it would really make a lot of difference to have the industry actually come into the classroom and tell them, how the topic that they are learning about will be actually uh, applicable, you know, in the industry and in, in, in their jobs. So basically what we're trying to do is to bring in a completely different perspective, you know, uh, into the classroom, from the field to the classroom, so to speak. Be and uh, in this way, uh, the industry will be able to see the kind of students that we have on campus and the university and uh, the students themselves will be given uh, a bigger you know outlook on uh, not just their program but also the experience of the industry players uh, 
you know, in perhaps in areas outside of specifically just just the program itself. So um, we think that by doing this, we will actually bring a completely different dimension into uh, classroom classroom learning. And so far, we have been getting very good response from the industry. Uh, some of them are alumni. Uh, some of them are uh, really good, you know, um, really, really uh, experienced uh, industry players that they want to give back. This is their, you know, opportunity to give back to the university. And uh, they may not necessarily expect payment. They may actually channel whatever payment that they might be getting into a different uh, into a different cause. Um, as you know, the students that we have in the university um, mostly belong to the lower socioeconomic um, group. So they may actually have the opportunity to also, you know, channel uh, some funds in that way. So basically, we're bringing in the industry onto campus. Um, for the purpose of the classroom experience, but also um, in this way, the uh, lecturers themselves will be able to engage more closely with with, with them. And um, and there may be so many other different ways that we will be able to uh, benefit from this, not just you know the students, but also the lecturers as well as the university. And um, we do have uh, partners from abroad as well who will be able will be able to come on board to to participate in this kind of program with us. Now that we are, you know, very agile and very adaptable in using online learning, so that's also a possibility. Uh, University of Malaya has um, had the experience of our students. Um, being placed for their internship, not just locally, but also abroad in the industries abroad. So um, that might be also another opportunity for us to expand on that program that we already have. So um, I know that we are you know, limited by time. I'm not sure, I'm not keeping time then, whether I had already used the 10 minutes that I have, but I'll be- questions later. Yeah, th yeah. Th thank you. Really helpful. And I, I like I like your final comment there around thinking about international internships and that opportunity. And that could be a really interesting aspect of, of international collaboration, that, that ability to facilitate some of those international uh, experiences with industry and see different um, practices and cultures um, yes. going and how that could then be you know really um, develop things in country so I, I'll be interested to see if um, uh, Francesca has some views on that so we'll come to you next um, uh, uh, Francesca and see how your your perspectives um, uh, compare and contrast to, to those uh, from from Professor Kamali there thank you uh, for that um, uh, session there and uh, Francesca over over to you Good morning. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Camilla. And uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to join you all here this morning or this evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so as Dan said in the introductions, I'm, I'm Francesca Walker-Martin. I'm chair of ASSET, which is a member organisation based in the UK. Um, we have 128 members. And to put that in context, we have about 140, depending how you define it, higher education institutions in the UK. So that's England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Um, so we focus very much upon work based and placement learning. And our ethos is that um, the application of knowledge and new knowledge is incredibly powerful in terms of of learning and enhancing the, the student experience and for embedding that knowledge. Um, so what we do is we support the uh, up to, uh, we have about 2000 individuals across England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales um, that we support through um, training, development and the, um, and we recommend good practice um, and we have developed a number of tools and techniques which are open source, ac uh, open to everybody um, to be able to, um, how to engage with, um, with, with 
organisations, depending on, uh, it doesn't matter what site it is. So what is the best practice in, in engaging with organisations? How to, to put um, internships, placements together? How to support the learners? How to prepare the learners and the students for those experiences? And also the challenges that come up. Who would have expected a global pandemic? Um, so during the, the global pandemic, um, we've we've moved all our provision on online. So we're, we're, we're providing a full range of support um, for our, our practitioners in, in universities across England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Um, OK, so um, the, the biggest impact that, that we have felt, of course, during the pandemic is um, everybody, everything having to move online. Um, and I'm really interested to, to hear about the challenges um, that, that you've had in Malaysia in terms of P uh, students gaining access to information, to training, to development, um, because we've had the same things here that, that not all students are able to, to access what we broadcast. We've also seen a, a, a major downturn, so we cover all um, topics, all areas from A to Z in terms of, so from that, that's accounting to zoology um, and, and all the, the business practices that, that happen um, within those organisations. Um, so a lot of our um, access to work based and placement learning um, suddenly uh, stopped overnight. Uh, of course, things like our health based professions, as one would expect, um, uh, escalated. Um, and so we, we had to find different ways to engage with um, employers um, and for um, for employers to access our services. And we did that in, the, in a number of ways um, across uh, across England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, across our, our community, um, because one thing that we've seen as a boom, um, a, a, a growth area during the pandemic is opportunities for universities to link with businesses. We always have, we always do, um, but to link more and to support. You mentioned, for example, SMEs, small and medium micro sized enterprises, um, but being able to support them and to keep those businesses going through a link with a right, student, which is supported by staff expertise, helping to develop and grow businesses. And what we have seen during this time is, is a real increase, um, uh, not unexpectedly, in, in digital technologies uh, and the, the digitization of business. Um, so as my colleagues have said um, earlier, we, what we have seen is a, a, a real increase in, right, where we have to move, we have to move quickly in terms of, of what we can deliver. Um, challenges remain the same, equipment, um, access to um, information and, and what we can do about that. Um, training from industry, um, it is very much what we do and um, we embrace anything that we can um, engage with. Um, every engagement is really powerful and, and important. But and one of the, the greatest opportunities that we have seen is because we are here in our boxes, um, we can be anywhere and um, we have seen a growth in partnerships across the world. So Asset as an organisation is part of a global um, organisation called WACE, um, which is the World Association of Cooperative Education. Um, so work-based learning, pre, uh, placements, that sort of terminology um, is also called cooperative education. And we have been working across the world during the pandemic with our partners to create links, enhance links, put people together, have global conversations to say, right, how, how can we work together um, and, and how, how, can, how can we um, deliver what needs to be delivered in these truly challenging times? And we 
listen so asset and its membership listen to employers and and what they want and need so our key driver at the moment is okay so we are moving to this wonderful online platform which makes so many things accessible um but what are the skills that we need to be developing in universities what is it that we need to be doing what skills do you need your um that the students um, coming out to to assist you in 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 uh, in industry, what do you need? What's missing? Please tell us so that we can help to enhance and and deliver that to the the people who are at the coalface and working um, with the young people. Um, working together through partnerships is um, something that we're seeing has always worked well, but we're seeing it in the asset community grow. Um, significantly. Um, we, we, we embrace and enhance these partnerships um, and what, what has happened is that the challenges of COVID, they're not going away, um, but they are also opportunities, opportunities for employers and universities to link together and talk to each other. Um, we have, as I mentioned, good practice guides. They are available on our website. I'll drop that into the chat so you can have a look at that and see um, maybe how, if you haven't thought of or you want to develop um, practice, then, then we can assist that. And as I mentioned, there's not just the, the UK um, version of, of asset, there is a global version as well. OK, Dan? Brilliant. Thank you for that really helpful and landscape. And I, I like the idea and, and you've you've drawn on this, but that, that COVID was a challenge, but it, it created opportunities, opportunities to think about things differently and to behave. Yeah. Um, it forced innovation, I think, in, in, and I've heard this in other sectors and other people talking about it, that the, 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 the sheer the suddenness and the imperative that brought that on really allowed organisations to behave and, and well to innovate far more rapidly and with agility than they've ever had done before and in fact Prabha we, we were discussing your own work with the British Council you've had to evolve how you do things things like this event and some of those things have been hugely positive um, and so I think I think thinking about that and, and clearly in the healthcare area there's been a huge opportunity for work-based um, learning because of this pandemic how can some of these things be retained that might be a question to think about um, uh, for some of the future sessions we have planned. Thank you both. I'm, I'm conscious we do need to, to move on to our next uh, session. Again, a, a really interesting dimension and it's produced a lot of conversation in the chat. I'm going to make sure we capture some of that chat um, and, and, and make sure we can draw on that for the for the report and some thoughts or some good observations um, and some challenging um, uh, um, thoughts are, uh, in there as well um, in terms of how some of these things can be made to work in a way that is uh, works for everybody and, and can deliver that. So thank you to our two previous speakers. I'm going to, to move on to our final session of the, the morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And we wanted now to bring in a little bit more of a perspective from industry thinking about what their perceptions are, what works in the UK, Malaysia, where the opportunities are and what's happening um, in those spaces. So we now have two speakers who are from organisations who have a joint university and, and industry leadership um, in there. That is the uh, Malaysian Industry Government Group for High Technology, MITE, and the National Centre for Universities and Business in the UK. Um, well, Razif um, uh, is from the from MITE, uh, works as a, a manager in the president and CEO's office for the Malaysian Industry Government Group for High Technology. This is a not profit, not for profit technology think tank formed in 1993, which builds and drives partnerships in technology, working with private and public sector organisations. It provides strategic advice, capacity building, support for policy interventions and manages flagship programmes. Uh, Razif um, uh, managed a number of international and local programmes, including the, the New Nunku Omar Fund and the Malaysia Advanced Technology Cluster and Hub, and, and is also, amongst all that, doing a, doing a PhD currently with Heriot Watt University. 
Uh, Fariba is the policy lead for research and innovation at the National Centre for Universities and Business. Uh, NCUB is an independent membership organisation that promotes, develops and supports university business collaboration across the UK. And, and the members are, are leaders from both business and universities. Um, launched in April 2013, it, it, it was launched following one of the many reviews of university business collaboration in, in, um, in the UK. Um, it, 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 developed from a predecessor organization that had been around for many years um, and its annual state of the relationship report is a real barometer of how well the UK is doing um, in terms of university industry collaboration and features a range of good practice, um, uh, uh, good practice examples and case studies. Uh, so that's an excellent publication. So Razif, over to you first please and your, your observations. Thank you. Hi Dan, uh, thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity and also to Ms. Prabha, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Razif, I'm from my Malaysian Industry Government Group for High Technology. Uh, those For those who don't know that, um, mine is also the focal country focal point for the Newton Oklahoma Fund. <clears throat> and then for me personally, um, I've been working with the Newton Oklahoma Fund <clears throat> initiative since, um, since it started in 2016. And I've done several um, international collaboration, um, translational work between Malaysia and UK. So um, basically, uh, if, if I like to, to, to point out one of, uh, um, I would say, the key, the key success factor for, for actually for international collaboration, it's the people. Uh, till today, I'm still amazed how two different people from two different backgrounds from the university and the industry <coughs> able to overcome challenges, able to overcome, even, even to this day during COVID, I, I'm still monitoring several projects between Malaysia and UK. And they do have, honestly, a very hard time to actually conduct their field works research, they cannot travel to meet each other, so they have to move into remote and etc. So the ability for them to innovate how they work, it's really important. And I think one of the key success factor for, for any international collaboration to work is people. But also I, I like to share with everyone since since um, um, we're, we're talking about international collaboration here, um, the, the some of the, not to say failure, but um, challenges in inter international collaboration, it's also people. And it's it's a very, very um, small, uh, small, it's very, very tiny thing, but it, it causes a very impact, which is a trust issues, right? which, which I've seen several times in different types of grants and projects. And I, I just want to share with everyone because I think this is important because trust issues is like cancer. You don't see it, you don't feel it. Sometimes you keep inside yourself but then at the end, you know, we do want that um, the work, the, the, the co collaboration yeah. to actually continue until they go, they, they, until the, the end of the project, they, they will continue to work together. But, uh, you know, sometimes yeah. I see that at the end of, of the uh, collaboration, they just part ways. So that's, 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 that's very, that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah. also, um, I think, I like when um, the previous panelists talk about technology transfer office because um, last year, uh, British Council, um, ITMA, International Technology Managers Association of Malaysia, uh, LP Synergies and also Mike, we actually conducted uh, several um, uh, workshops to actually trying to uplift the technology transfer office as the platform to, you know, to get the university and industry to work better together, you know. Um, I mean, if you even though you look at the the current literature reviews or the previous literature reviews, you see that TTOs is more of a very operational kind of thing. They need to process IP, they need to do the filing and etc. But the tech transfer office plays a much larger and strategic role, and really not just bring the industry and the university together, but bringing the innovation community together. And this is essentially a very large group. I like to bring, I like to bring an analogy here. Uh, just imagine yourself as a F1 driver. You're trying to finish the race. Um, 
uh, it takes about what 200 kilometers or more than 60 laps. Just imagine yourself, you're just the driver and you're trying to finish that. You will not make it. You will run out of gas. Your your tire will be, um, you know, not working properly. Your system mechanics and, and etc. So at at the pit stop, you'll see there's a lot of people um, working. There's someone going to be changing the tires. There's going to be someone. Uh, filling the gas, there's be someone at the back that's actually doing the strategic part of what and just all and all that. So this is basically the community community concept that's is important. It doesn't matter from what 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 um, what fields are you are from. You can be industry, government, or whatever. You, but the end game is has to be one to win the commercialization race. I think that's important, and then we we do really need to change. Um, how we do things. We cannot depend on what we do because um, at my, there are we, we are actually looking at several trends and I think one of the trends that's actually um, really affecting um, that will define the post-pandemic futures, uh, one is infectious control, that's one, because we know that regardless, um, the practice of hygiene, sanitation, test, testing, it will continue beyond the crisis uh, remote work and commerce we there's i mean as, as we all know we're all working from home even though there's going to be international collaboration people are still working from home um, improve resiliency that's another one um, there's going to be need of rethinking of the supply chain and how because as border close you know we need to find other options of how to do things the policies need to be a need to be better agile um, the practices, technology, processes um, also needs to be adaptable and also the macroeconomic, macroeconomic impacts. So if you put all these trends together, definitely business will be unusual. You, we do need to do, it, do things differently. So, um, and um, you know, when, so once you get your, co your communities, innovation communities together, you do need to sort of have a framework in mind you know, how how are we going to move the innovation to the marketplace? I think that's that's basically the end game. It, it's either can be a, just a um, domestic collaboration between industry, industry and university, but, but it also applies for uh, international collaboration, which is, uh, it might, we have this framework we call FIRST, but for this context, we have to put M at the end. So FIRST uh, at the F basically stands for finance, uh, financial, you need to understand what are the various uh, financial mechanisms that's out there, what are the grants that's out there. Uh, like I think like Francis Zhu mentioned that some grants has been gone, and but some has been shifted, so you need to be aware of these trends. Uh, I basically is the infrastructure and also the institution, who are the players that is going to help to move this innovation to the marketplace. So it's not just industry and university, it, it, there are also other other organization that will help this. Um, uh, FIR, R, okay. R is another important, regulatory. As you're working with new technology, because you need to understand that when technology comes into the market, it will disrupt. So, I mean, there is the National Technology Innovation Sandbox. Yes, that's right. So you need to work with this kind of organization to ensure that when you move your technology to the marketplace, it will not disrupt, okay? I can give I can give the money to the university and the industry, but if if the market is not not ready to receive it, then you will have the scenario of um, Grab versus taxis, Airbnb versus hotels. So that's going to cause problems for you know for for all of us. Um, as skill and talents, you have to, to ensure that when technology is out there, you know there there is a pool of talent that is actually able to 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 you know to ensure that it's. Uh, you're able to use it. And last but not least, uh, technology. You need to be aware that technology is moving at exponential rate. Uh, means that um, you might be developing a technology today, but in future, it could be obsolete. So this is something that, as a community, you need to be aware together. And then last but, last but not least is M, market. So this is the element that is, it is really, really important to, to have at the back of your mind. Uh, so then, uh, that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Excellent. Thank you. Good talk. And last, but by no means least, I'd I'd like to move on to our final speaker of the the session. Um, 
Freeba from the National Centre of Universities and uh, Business in the UK. Um, over, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I, my name is Fariba Sotan. I think, uh, Dan, you've done a good job of introducing the, the National Centre for Universities and Business, um, but we primarily we look to promote and enhance working relationships between universities and businesses. Um, many of the speakers have already spoken about the impact of COVID-19, and I think it would be amiss for, for, for me not to acknowledge it in terms of the, the, the year, the past year has affected, the pandemic has affected every corner of the globe. It's also a year that has brought on, that has really highlighted the importance of collaboration between academia and, and industry into the public consciousness. The UK collaboration between Oxford University and pharma company AstraZeneca produced a vaccine that was only possible because of a translation of knowledge and cutting edge ideas uh, worked through for over the past 10 years into real, into solutions for real world challenges. And for many businesses around the world, and I'll speak from the perspective of the UK, harnessing that power of research and innovation is critical to success. Our research has found that following the 2008 crash showed that businesses that were able to innovate were more resilient to the ups and downs of the market that followed. But the world is also facing even broader environmental and societal cha challenges that my colleague has just highlighted um, and changes. So those challenges also pre present commercial opportunities, but things like tackling climate change, supporting an aging society, confronting COVID-19, these are all, there is a real opportunity to harness the power of new ideas, new approaches and new products and services. What we know is that COVID-19 is only likely to accelerate the transformation of economies and it will affect almost every aspect of global industry and disrupt, disrupt activity in key sectors that the UK is strong in. Our research has already shown that 90% of partnerships between universities and businesses have suffered due to COVID-19. But we also recognize that realizing the opportunities from R&D and innovation could have a transformational effect on the UK economy. And that's where we have concentrated our efforts. So going into this pandemic year, how, how, has, the UK been, how has the UK doing on the, uh, on the collaboration front? Well, we weren't going into it into a week, from a weak spot. Across the 2017-18 uh, academic year, and that's the latest year that we have data, and as Dan mentioned, that comes from our NCUB annual report, uh, State of the Relationship, it showed that universities had an overall increase in the number of interactions with businesses of all sizes. So that showed an increase of 10%, and income, income from these interactions had risen by 4%. R&D spending from businesses was also in the increase, so during that same year, the UK uh, saw an increase of nearly 9% in real term amounts of UK business R&D investment in higher education, taking the total investment to 389 million. That's, that was a significant increase to previous years. So it's an encouraging trend that UK businesses are increasing their invest, investment in R&D through UK universities, and it's a notable spike to monitor in future years. We also, the UK also performs exceptionally well in research. Um, it was ranked first on field weighted citation impact since 2007, produces 7% of the world's academic publications and 14% of the world's most highly cited academic publications. The research base is also exceptionally collaborative. 55% of the UK's academic publications were the result of international collaboration, making the UK the second most internationally collaborative country in the G7. And all of these strengths are important, but they're not sufficient to becoming the world, world leading in research translation. And many of our colleagues have already highlighted this translation from research into real world, world ideas and products. Countries around the world, including Malaysia, I imagine are grappling with the difficult question of how to move from research through to development and innovation. And the UK is no exception to this. Um, what we're what we're recognizing is that we cannot be complacent in assuming that continuing investment from businesses will will uh, will resume as we enter a recession that may be the worst for the UK in 300 years. So what next? How do we increase collaboration and also see the benefits from it to fuel economic recovery? Understanding the role in, uh, that science and innovation can play in fueling economic success has been. Uh, the basis for why the UK government has set a target to raise spending on R&D to 2.4% of the GDP by 2027 and 3% in the long term. 
this is not simply a, re a, a, a tweak in R&D spending, but actually resets the baseline of spending and refocuses the UK's economy towards research intensive activities. For many years, the UK has re spending, R and D spending has lagged behind key competitors, um, and it's currently set at uh, about 0.5 percent of GDP, which is much lower than the levels invested by the US, Germany, and France. But like I said, we also recognise that driving economic recovery through research and innovation is not just about increasing government funding, but it's also about leveraging business funding as well. So how do we increase R&D and innovation investment through collaboration? In, uh, in July last year, we were asked by the uh, UK's primary um, research funding body, to, which is UKRI, to undertake to set up a task force. And so we convened prominent senior business and university leaders to provide advice on how the gov government's ambitions for R&D could be met through greater partnerships and collaborations. The task force recommended four key recommendations. The first one was about setting priority. So to set a, a bold new economic plan with research and innovation as its engine, and that has come to to pass, I think, in the, in the recent economic growth plan that was published by our Chancellor recently. But that means also prioritizing policy making that coordinates decisions across different levels of government and parts of the UK and across remits of departments and budgets. And I think that has been a criticism in uh, across the UK is that governments are uh, independently prioritizing R&D, but not necessarily speaking to one another. The second was around synergy. So the UK needs a business focused offer. Achieving this by joining up existing wider fiscal and re regulatory initiatives designed to pre encourage research and innovation. And a key aspect of this was to establish innovation collaboration zones, which will build on the idea of free ports and the kind of um, tax and, and uh, regulatory incentives that are included in these zones, but center these around universities. The third one is around enablers, so scaling up strategic enablers of the research and innovation system uh, through investment in more adaptable and diverse R&D workforce, for example, and through funding streams that encourage collaboration. So we've made a recommendation to establish Global Collaboration Fund, which is about ensuring that universities can kind of pull together to get more of the, the R&D investment pot from different um, multinational companies. And finally, attractiveness. So our recommendation was that the UK develop a, an, an F, FDI uh, investment strategy that really sets the UK as, as behaving as a competitor in a global market for R&D investment to attract higher levels of globally mobile re business research. So we've got a government here in the UK that has committed to making the nation an economic science superpower. And they've reaffirmed their commitment to increasing R&D spending uh, through recent uh, government announcements. But what has been um, of concern is recent budget cuts to fundamental research, largely in universities. Our priority is for the government to stay true to, the gov to their commitment to enable collaboration and partnerships to continue. And this will drive, help drive economic recovery. There are so many examples of what universities are doing to help local businesses. Some of our colleagues have sort of touched on these already and they pay, play a pivotal role in their local area of recovery. We want to ensure that universities and businesses have the right incentives and enablers to make that happen on a much larger scale. Thanks, Dan. Excellent, thank you for that uh, really helpful overview of, of how you see some of the priorities and, and challenges ahead. Um, and, and I think um, just, just coming back to some of those thoughts and just thinking a little bit about wrapping up um, some of the sessions I can see there's been a generated quite a lot of chat in the in the uh, you know some questions and comments around that leadership has come up in terms of some of those observations around clarity about institutional leadership and 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 what individual academics are expected to do in some of those places and I think in some of those areas that's where good practice can really be helpful and, and support that um, but actually through all of the conversations today I've also been struck by you know the emphasis around partnership and building and expanding on some of those partnerships they may start in one place but they can develop into other areas and and those relationships can can develop the importance of that co-creation side of things you know working together to understand what the challenge is and actually create something and and I think for me that's one of the areas that 
I've I've observed as as uh, in terms of successful things in the UK is that when academics have a real interest in the company and what the challenges are that's when the great collaboration starts to work because it is about understanding on both sides and pulling that through. So some important points I think have come out through the day we'll we'll look to capture these and we're going to draw on the 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 co helpful comments and observations in the chat as well to do that. Um, my my thanks, a, a massive thanks to to a, a fantastic range of speakers today who've given us a really good range of um, uh, experiences and observations, um, some challenges, and and I think out of some of the challenges like COVID are also coming opportunities, um, and including opportunities for for working internationally. That that um, uh, I particularly like the idea that that digital means anywhere, um, and and that is certainly our own experience um, uh, in terms of some of our work um, that, that where you are suddenly doesn't matter so much. You can actually work effectively with people all over the place. So thank you for joining us today. I know Prabha wants to say a few words. Um, I'll just hand over to, to Prabha now so she can, can say just a few closing words and, and reference a couple of other things that are happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, first and foremost, a huge shout out to our speakers um, for joining us and for sharing all your perspectives with us. It was really an interesting discussion. I think there's been an equally interesting discussion going on in the chat and uh, we would love to pick up on some of those points, consolidate that in our report and share that with all of you as well as everyone who registered for, for the event. We had a fantastic turnout, fantastic panel of speakers. We really appreciate that and for you to, for, for, uh, you know, to be spending two hours with us. Um, something that Simon uh, said right at the beginning struck me um, and, uh, and I think that that's really important. Looking at university industry engagement uh, and building it as a model of uh, co-learning, co-designed and having co-ownership. I think uh, there were lots of conversations about trust in the chat and I think, uh, you know, a, a co-created model where, where each party sees value in that collaboration, that is something we really need to work at. So I think that's amazing. So uh, just to just to uh, end this, I just want to share something. Uh, and if uh, Victoria could just put on the, the final slide, please. I just want to share the um, British Council scholarships for women in STEM. So since many of you are here, uh, I just wanted to say that we are the final leg of this scholarship. This is the first time the British Council has put out this scholarship. And this for Malaysian, uh, it's for it's for women uh, in STEM to pursue a master's uh, degree in the UK, selected universities, very tight timeline at the moment. Um, Malaysia is one of the countries which is el eligible for this in Southeast Asia. So please, uh, if you are interested or if you do know any of your students or uh, academia, friends from the uh, academia who are interested, please do go on the link uh, on the on the on the on the slide or just Google British Council Women in STEM scholarships and you'd be able to to check out if there's anything there uh, that interests you or interests someone you know. So uh, we will also share with all of you uh, future events, upcoming activities and uh, hopefully develop some of these themes further that we can take forward uh, conversations as Dan had stated earlier. Um, that's it from me. Thank you all so much for joining. Have a good uh, rest of the day or have a good evening wherever you all mm. are. And um, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks yeah. for that excellent session um, as well. Thank you. And, and let me just add by, uh, just finish by adding my thanks to the team working behind the scenes. Uh, so there's Shalini, Shauki, Riffin and Victoria who've been working behind the scenes to try and keep us in order and, and helping to prepare for the event. So thank you to you and thank you to everyone for participating.